Thank you, Ayman. Welcome back from your break. It's beautiful out there, so if you're in here, it means you're really committed, and that's good to see. My name is Chris, and I'm the director of Amid East, and I'm here to talk about U.S. higher education en anglais. Ils ont préféré que je parle en anglais. So you've got to think twice as I talk. I'll try not to talk too fast. The, uh, the mission, or one of the missions of Amid East, is to support U.S. higher education, that is to study in the United States. It's one of our goals. We do so very closely with Education USA and with the American Embassy. So I'll talk a little bit about United States higher education as well as MOOCs. I'll explain what a MOOC is in just a minute. But I thought I would tell the story of U.S. higher education by numbers. Each number will tell a little bit of a, of a short story of what is happening. First number I throw up there, 21 million. There are 21 million students that study within the higher education system in the United States. That makes it one of the largest in the world. It also makes it one of the most dynamic. And in fact, one would argue that it's maybe the most dynamic, most attractive higher education system in the world. And you might wonder, well, why? What makes it so attractive? Well, there are a lot of different features to it. One of them as well is how many institutions exist out there between community colleges, four-year institutions, public and private, various other types of entities. There are nearly 5,000 kinds of places you can study. Imagine that. In Tunisia, you've got 13 public institutions, about 25 EZs, and maybe a few other private institutions. Compare it to 5,000 institutions that you can choose from to go to. It's a remarkable difference, and it's a very big dynamic factor within the system itself. Another big The big piece about it is it's considered a very high-quality system. Why is that? Well, there are a lot of different reasons, but one of them, if you look at global university rankings, uh, one of the most common is the Shanghai ranking. Usually, if you look at the top 40 to 50 universities, every single year, the top 30 of those will be an American institution. And we look at some of those rankings are based upon research output, that is the number of articles published in journals or books published, or as well as awards made, that is Nobel Prizes awarded and whatnot. So one of the high quality dimensions of it is just how much output comes from the institutions themselves. Another key indicator is looking at research and development. 65 trillion dollars, trillion dollars has actually been invested in 2011 in U.S. institutions. So And a university in the United States is not just a place that you go to to study. It's a place where you go to to invent. It's a place where you go to to create things, create global patents. And it's a driver of the national economy in a very, very big way. It's one of the founding features of the system itself is how much research and development takes place within the university sphere. Another fa facet of it, it's a fairly equitable place. That is, most of the people in universities in the United States are not white guys like me. They're actually women, and it's a fairly even balance. It's also very diverse in terms of ethnicity. You have a huge percentage of Hispanics and Asians, that is, of various different ethnicities, that are graduates within the system itself. So if you walk into an American community college or a university, you see a very diverse environment. It's very mixed up. And that creates innovation, that creates all kinds of possibilities uh, for change compared to a very homogenous system. Another dimension of it, though, that's hard to understand from, from outside is that about 59% of American students complete an undergraduate degree in six years. Now, an undergraduate degree is actually four years in length, in theory. So you might ask, why does it take six years to complete a degree in four years? Well, one of the issues is that most American students don't actually study full-time. In many, many cases, they are either studying full-time or studying part-time, and either way, they are working along the side. So they have different, uh, contribu or different requirements as they go through the system. As a consequence, it takes longer for American students to get through a degree program. And that's a big challenge in terms of uh, the outputs, the graduation rates within American universities. We, one reason why Americans are actually not being able to complete a degree within four years is the cost. Here in Tunisia, your education is largely free. Not at, the, not at Esprit, but in uh, most of the other institutions it is. In the United States, the cost of education is very expensive relative to other places in the world. And at a community college level, two-year diploma program, the average cost is just over $15,000 a year. That includes your books, your transportation, your food, your living expenses, tuition, and fees. 
So that's, that's quite expensive just starting out. That's some of the cheapest dimension of it. If you go to a four-year public institution, that is an institution that receives uh, state subsidies in some way, it jumps up to perhaps $20,000, $23,000 per year. And if you want to look at really expensive dimensions of higher education in America, it goes to almost $45,000 a year for a private institutional experience over four years. So there is a real cost factor that has played into how the dynamism uh, takes place within the higher education system in the United States. Another big part uh, of uh, higher education in the United States is the number of international students that actually attend. Over 800,000 went to the United States last year to study. That's an enormous number, a 7% increase from the last year before that. And it's a record number. We've never seen so many before. Now, what's incredible about that number is that almost half of them come from three countries, China, India, and South Korea. So when you walk into a classroom, especially a graduate-level classroom in the United States, you will often see nationalities of those three different countries present. In fact, they also con congregate or they come together in three particular disciplines. 40% of all international students study three particular subjects. They either come for business, an MBA program, they come for engineering, or they come for computer science. All these three domains are considered leading, leader, leading domains, leading fields, academic disciplines in the entire world. That's where people go to find cutting edge education uh, on the, in those three, three different areas. Another interesting aspect, comparing from yourselves, only 445 Tunisians went to the United States last year. Uh, to study abroad, a very small number. 25 of them had a scholarship from Ahmed East. It's one of the things that we provide, is scholarships to study abroad, and we encourage that as well. We'd like to see that number grow much larger, uh, and part of it is what Ahmed East is trying to do, is to promote higher education. Another, another thing to keep in mind, dollars zero free. That is, if you would like to learn more about U.S. higher education, come on down to the Ahmed East in downtown Tunis. We have an educational advisor there. You can learn all that you want about what are the opportunities, what kinds of scholarships, where to go, what disciplines in the office there. It's a free service. Another aspect of what you might consider access to free education in the United States would be online courses. Last year, 5.5 million students took an online course in the United States. It's a huge and growing dimension. And one aspect of that is looking at MOOCs. Now, you might ask, what is a MOOC? What is a MOOC? A MOOC is a massive, open, online course. And we say massive because, in many cases, these courses have tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of students enrolled in one course at the same time. It is massive. It is open because anybody can go. Anybody can log on and sign up. It is free. So it's an open source system. Anybody can do it from anywhere in the world. It is online. That is, you simply need an internet connection to be able to get online. And it's a course. That is, it starts and it has an ending, although it's self-paced. That is, in many respects, you don't have to start at a certain time. You start when you want, and you finish how fast you want. That is, you can go through the course as quickly as you would like. Three different companies or entities now manage most of the MOOCs in the world today. They are edX, Coursera, and Udacity. edX is actually a nonprofit. It's founded by Stanford and Harvard. Um, Udacity and Coursera are for-profit institutions. But why this has become such a big trend, why MOOCs have become such a big attraction in the press and around the world, is because the leading institutions in the world have been supporting them. They've created these things. And the best professors in the best institutions are the ones offering the classes for free. And so it's attracted hundreds of thousands, millions of people to log on and sign up. And that's what's made MOOCs transformational. That's what's made them a trend to consider for the future. Now, a lot of people, there's a big debate going on now. Are MOOCs truly transformational? Are they or are they not? Or is it a passing thread? something, a trend that will come and go in the coming years, and we'll, we'll hear nothing of it. Well, increasingly, it is transformational for, for one big foundational reason. That is, the education system that we know today is moving from time served to stuff learned. What I mean by that is, you all are enrolled in an education program right now, perhaps an engineering degree. You start in in year one, you take a certain number of courses, you graduate to year two, year three, and so on, and then you graduate. You serve a certain amount of time in a very traditional fashion to get your degree. 
But increasingly, employers and the world, they don't really care what degree you have. They want to know how can you use the information you've learned? What can you do with that information? So we're moving to a model of competencies. What can you do? Competencies. And in that sense, you can get those competencies increasingly from anywhere in the world. And that's, again, the added value of a MOOC. You can start to online in any place in the world and go through a course. So that's the foundation of why people are talking so much about MOOCs today, is because they see how they can affect higher education in any country, any institution, any place in the world. When we think about what's happening now in MOOCs, you think you have two different things happening. One, you have people that are, that are online, logging on and taking a MOOC course. Anytime, for fun, for free, kind of curious. Most people, in that case, never finish their courses. That is, the completion rate in most MOOC courses is only 10%. But you have another segment of the population that is completing them, and they're starting to pay for a credential that is issued from Harvard, from Stanford, from MIT, from University of Pennsylvania. They're being issued from the best institutions in the world, a credential that you can get online for completing these courses. And you have to pay a small fee, perhaps, to get it. Another dimension of MOOCs, though, that's perhaps more transformative is how they will be blended together with traditional education. Increasingly, you will have a certain portion of your class that will be offered online, and you will be expected, as a form of homework, perhaps, to be going online and listening to the lectures. And as you listen to the lectures, you get the, heart, the core knowledge from that class. And then you come to the class, you actually come to the campus, you come to the classroom, and that's where you discuss, you problem solve, you network, you build community. That dimension of the blended approach is what educators today think is the best prospects for MOOCs. And that's kind of where we're heading for the, for the immediate future. So in a sense, it doesn't supplant higher education traditionally, it supplements higher education. It's an added value to the kind of traditional classroom environment that you are familiar with. So the future, what is the future for MOOCs in higher education perhaps? Well, well before I get there, three, four challenges. One issue that's a big question mark with MOOCs is how you grade them. If you take a class and you're online and you're at home, then you can cheat on the exam, right? I mean, who could take the exam? Anybody can take the exams. So trying to work out an assessment structure that makes sense and that actually reflects real learning outcomes is a big challenge within the MOOC structure today. Another big one is itself um, what we call in English the, the sage on the stage. That is, increasingly, um, we are moving away from a pedagogy in instruction where it's one person stands up, I have the knowledge, I give it to you, you learn it. You study it, you pass an exam. You've heard from other speakers today that that model of education works fairly poorly. And really, a model of education is one that involves a discourse with people, an exchange, it's problem solving, it's more creative. That's the model of education that we're really aiming for, but a MOOC brings it right back to the sage on the stage. And that's a big criticism of it, is that, in fact, it, re it goes back to a very traditional form of pedagogy because, ultimately, it's about a professor putting up his views on a screen, on a video, and then putting them online. So it's interesting how that will play out in terms of MOOCs as well. Another dimension is how to make money from it. If, if there's going to be a real, real drive on this, Udacity or uh, edX, they're going to need to figure out how they make money on it. And at the moment, it's all free. And people are kind of scratching their heads. Well, it's all exciting. Everybody likes it. Millions of people are, are tuning in and getting online. But uh, how do we make a business model out of this? That's not entirely understood today. Perhaps they'll license the courses, perhaps not. This stuff is so new and it's changing so rapidly. If you had asked two years ago what's a MOOC, it never would have been heard of practically. They were only invented literally three years ago and only in the last 12 months do you see millions of people drawing online to them. Final comments. Uh, the future of MOOCs and what makes it truly transformable are the possibilities maybe well into the future, maybe to the next generation. The idea that you can sign up online and get a credential, and that credential will be reflecting real knowledge that you can know and things you can do, and that would be recognized by an employer or by your, your colleague in your communities. And so that when you print out that credential, that certificate, it has real meaning to it. That's the possibility. And so in the longer term, the idea of actually subscribing online and building your own degree, signing up for the favorite courses that you have, 
putting your own composite together and taking the best courses from the best professors from the best universities to create your own degree online that is absolutely recognizable and certified in the same way an engineering degree from Esprit would be. That is truly transformational. So that's the, that's the, the direction that we may well be heading for the future of MOOCs and online education. And it's a core dimension of what US higher education is doing today. They're driving it forward. We'll see where it goes. One final comment. The uh, MOOCs right now, 99% of them are all in English. So you've got to know your English for that. And you're welcome to come to Amity's for that too. Thank you.